Strap yourselves in. You're listening to the Power Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week on the show, we have a guy who has spent his whole life living in the shadows of his older brother. I'm talking about Garai Dadali, and we had his brother on the show a few weeks ago, Ahmet Dadali. And while Garai has been working to create a name for himself in the ski world, he eventually realized there was no way around being known as Ahmet's little brother, and he decided to own it. And while he is now known as Ahmet's brother in the world of ski marketing, today Garai is breaking a new trail in the ski world that doesn't involve bootpacking with his company Daymaker Touring. And while everyone thinks of him as Ahmet's brother, he's really an engineer armed with a degree and a passion for sliding on snow. The other half of the Dadali puzzle is just as interesting as the older version in a different way. Before we get into the podcast, I want to let you know that summer is not over. I'll have one or two more summer episodes that will come out once they are recorded. The research is done, the guests have committed, and now we're just waiting on them. If the last interviews of summer don't happen, not a big deal. The show will go on and it will teach me a lesson that I'm glad I've never had to learn before. And that lesson is, sometimes yes really means no, no matter how many times a person says yes. Everyone should understand that lesson. Enough of my rant. Now I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram, at the Powell Movement. Tell your friends about the show, and shoot me an email if you have any guest suggestions or just want to share something. My email is mike at thepowellmovement.com, and I will get back to you. I also need to thank my amazing sponsors who make the show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Garai Dadali. Garai. Hey, Mike. How's it going, man? Good. Just wrapping up some business stuff this morning. What kind of business stuff are you wrapping up? I just recently was involved with designing a backpack with a snowmobile company. Maybe some people have heard of MoPros. They make racks for carrying like snowboards and skis for your sled. And I, I met him up in Mount Baker this past winter with my brother. Um, that's been riding with those guys for a while. So he had kind of known that I was a designer and reached out maybe a month ago. I was looking to have a bag done and just been working on that with him. Before we get into your lifetimes and all the things that you do, what's a summer like for you these days? Summer's been quite a bit of time of sitting in the office here and try to get out, hike some mountains, do a little rock climbing, little backpacking. Yeah. Trying to be an outdoorsy man while being a super inside nerd. And it seems like in your life and times, I mean, you have been the super outdoorsy type person who's always had that secret nerd inside of them. And now that the pro ski career, it's not taking over and becoming the cash cow, but you have to figure out a means to get by and you want to stay in skiing. So that inner nerd comes out and you're able to develop products and stay within the ski industry. Yeah, absolutely. I think you now that there there was a an early realization for me that skiing was never going to pay my bills. It could maybe pay for skiing, but that's about it. So got to find other means, hopefully cool projects involved in skiing, around skiing, so it can keep me skiing and projects outside of it, too. Yeah, I think your story is interesting because you grew up in the shadow of an older brother who has a big persona in the ski industry. And both of you were kind of vying, I would say, for sponsorship and doing well. But I think the dream for each of you was to get sponsors and become pro skiers. And while it really worked well for your brother, it took a long time for it really to blossom for yourself. And when I say blossom, it's a much smaller blossom. I think a lot of your life is going to be talking about your brother, his shadow, and how you've experienced that. But we interviewed your brother a couple weeks ago, and we went through a lot of his childhood. And I'll assume that a lot of his childhood is very similar to a lot of your childhood. So I'm going to pick and choose what I talk about, about your upbringing, and then we'll get into skiing. Sound good? Yeah, man. Let's chat about it. One thing that we established with your brother is that you guys had a different upbringing than most. I mean, there was a, a Turkish influence in the household. And how did that affect you growing up? Definitely that hard work in Eastern work ethic. 
to recap, when when friends would come over, we'd definitely be outside logging wood or working on his bulldozer, digging out all the mud tracks, things like that. He didn't really want us around skiing that much, just told us it was childish and didn't support it. Not all of it's bad. Working hard, learn how to do a lot of things, especially cutting wood. There are times in my life where I had to fall back to cutting wood as a job to get by and actually currently doing that here and there in Park City to keep the wallet with some sort of cash and pay my rent. So I got to thank my pops for teaching me how to be a proper lumberjack. And he's probably pissed that you're still cutting wood. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he knows I'm doing that right now. Well, he probably won't hear this, so it doesn't matter. He's not too tech savvy. So you guys had to work all the time growing up, especially when friends came over because that was extra help. And was he nice to you guys at the same time? Or was it a tough upbringing? When friends were over, he was always a a nice guy. But when, when we were a young age, it was definitely a tough upbringing. I think a lot of people growing up in more of an American or Western society, they deal with their father as being a lot of times like a friend figure. Yeah. An advice figure too. And that didn't exist. He was he was a pretty awful teacher. He was like a force teacher and never talked to him about really anything. Like I didn't know that much about his upbringing other than he was from Turkey. He wouldn't really laugh, joke, teach us much. It was just kind of like, Man, a lot of religion and work. And when you got in trouble, did you get hit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, you know, getting smacked was one thing. And then just so much loud yelling, anger. I think that that goes a lot further than getting smacked. That was worse, the yelling? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And it just radiates. Like, me and I met are quite different. Where, like, I think when he's in a a loud environment and, like, yelling and discomfort he can dish it right back but a lot of times as i was like the youngest brother and the smallest one in the family i'd go in more like recluse style where all that yelling just made me want to get away from everything you know it's funny because i think i met you a couple different times at powder awards and my takeaway was you weren't mingling around with anybody you were kind of just sitting at our table and if someone sat next to you you were going to talk with them and chill but where your brother was more like the social butterfly talking a little bit more, you were like the quiet, reserved one. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you could probably say that you're a a product of your environment. I definitely got out-talked as a child, and I'd let him do most of the talking, and me, uh, hopefully I can do all the backing up. Speaking of the backing up, I mean, when you look at your brother, he's a little bit smaller than you. How big are you? Uh, I'm about six foot one. Yeah, usually about a buck 80 at any given time. Much bigger than your brother. Yeah, a lot bigger, and yet he can definitely cast that big shadow for such a small guy. Yeah. And growing up with that size difference, it might not have existed when you were younger, but were you guys friendly the whole time growing up, or was there a lot of infighting between you and your brother? There was a lot of little fights and scuffles. I remember one time just being lit up again at him, and I was kind of the one where like it builds and builds. Like I'd let him get away with this, let him get away with that, and then... But one time he'll just like push it too far and I just go like, you know, psycho younger brother on him and ended up like fighting upstairs and threw him into the wall and just smashed out this big part of fucking drywall. (laughs) We were just like, oh shit. We looked at each other and just like dad's going to fucking kill us. And did your dad kill you? I mean, I'm alive today, but I think that time my my mom did a lot of uh, talking for us to try and get us out of shit and saying that like something happened, like we were moving something and fell into it, busted the wall. Man, so you're kind of walking on eggshells at home. Like you have your mom defending you for things that you're doing so you don't get in trouble with your dad. Yeah, yeah, that happened a ton. Any fights that result in something breaking or like a cup or a glass breaking, whatever. I think think my mom would try to hide the truth a bit so that it wouldn't come down on us so harsh. And I, I had an oldest brother that most people don't know about. He's six years older than me. And four years older than I met. And he definitely took a lot of the, the family brunt of the harsh life and beatings. And he's not really in the family so much anymore. Are you friends with him and Ahmet? I'm not. Ahmet talks to him a little bit more and my sisters talk to him. But I'm, I'm really distant with him. The last time I saw him was when I was 17. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I remember he, he joined the Navy 
And when I was 17, he came back. I was playing a soccer game, and I saw him there very briefly, like right before my game. And he was like, whoa, you're like, you're big now. And then I, I never saw him again. And I talked to him once. My mom was really sick. She had cancer. And when she was getting a big surgery, they were all at home on the phone. It was when I was going through finals. And I actually didn't even know that she was getting surgery. She didn't tell me because she didn't want me to miss school and fail out or anything. Right. So all, all the family was there except for me. I was in Utah. And when I was on the phone, I went to talk to him. And his first thing was like, what do you want? I was like, dude, I haven't talked to you since I was 17. And the first fucking thing you say to me is, what do you want? I just hung up there and haven't talked to him since. Wow. And then you have sisters as well. I didn't realize you had this big of a family. Yeah, man. That's why when I was saying, you know, I was kind of like the little guy in the back and, and fell to it. It's because I'm the last of five kids. I have an oldest sister and she's great. She lives in Boston. Fairly outdoorsy type, her and her husband. At the same time as being like really outdoorsy, she's a total nerd, just like a, a biogeneticist. And then I have a sister who just had a kid. She's a nurse in Baltimore. And then me and Matt are the ones that kind of swayed off from everyone, decided to go out west and try to live our ski lives. Well, I mean, you can almost look at it as the sisters are doing well. The older brother we don't really know about right now and you don't speak with. Ahmet's doing well in his pro ski world, but what's going to happen after the pro ski world? Who knows? Because Ahmed has focused everything on skiing. And while that is a respectable and honorable thing, there isn't a big future in it unless your last name is Plake and the dolly is not Plake. And then you've got you who, while the ski career is never going to be what Ahmet's is, you have a different career in the background where, you know, you did get that education and you can do things and we'll talk about what you're doing. But growing up, it sounds like you played soccer. Do you play any other sports? Just soccer. We did little extreme things, dabbled in like rollerblading and mostly it was just practice for skiing. And it was all that whole I hate New York crew. Eventually that is the crew you're hanging with. Yeah, yeah, man. We did a lot of cool shit together. Like once me and my brother met Will and Andy, and we had some other guys in the group too. Uh, Eric Olson was a big part of it, Ross and Berja. And yeah, we'd like rollerblade and jump off ramps. And it's, it's funny too. I've, I've been a coach in skiing for a long time too. And I kind of stepped back from it now just to focus on my own skiing. Yep. But I'll be like up at the water ramps and all that and talk to the kids and be like, dude, I used to do this as a kid, but we do it on rollerblades in the like Will's parents' horse pond. <laughs> so. Quite a difference, the same concept, but way more raw. Was Will an equestrian type dude growing up? Did he ride horses and do that kind of stuff too? <laughs> no, no. Oh man, I was hoping you were going to say he wore that fuzzy hat and those stretch pants and he jumped gates. I thought that would be amazing to add to his story because he's not that big of a talker, so he wouldn't really share that with anyone. No, no, you got to dive deep for those ones, but uh, it was his aunt. I believe, lived in the area and had, had a bunch of horses in this land. And they had just the perfect pond situation where there was a hill that was like 100 feet tall leading right into it. And we were able to build a pretty sick ramp and plywood drop in all that, run down it and jump into that. And you guys pretty much invented the summer setup, it seems like. I mean, I'm sure they existed elsewhere, but when New Schoolers was blowing up, you guys were kind of the forefront of creating a badass summer setup and putting edits online. Yeah, dude. If it was ever checked out, Pooper Park, that's the labels that we went under for it. And we just, all the time growing up, saw these rad things coming out, like the Super Park and Mammoth. And by that time of year, like in the spring, we really couldn't do any more skiing and decided to push it to AstroTurf and truck in a bunch of snow from the ice rink sometimes and just put so much work in these grand ice things and, and pooper park was rad we did like three different places we did one in my far backyard where i had some metal rails did another one in our front yard where we towed in with like a mat had an old jeep cherokee with the wood panels and we were doing a tow in to maybe like a 30 foot long six foot high rainbow rail which is crazy for like a midsummer setup you don't see anyone doing fucking car tow-ins to rail setups no Pre winch days. Now kids are probably setting up winches in their yard if they want to hit anything that big. But back then, people weren't building summer setups, I don't think. This is probably what, 2004? Maybe even before? I'd say anywhere from like 
2003 to about 2006, 2007 is when we're doing this. Would you look at those videos? I mean, there's a lot of the I Hate New York videos that help blow you up, per se, your whole crew. But those summer setups got so much attention because no one was doing it. And did that help put you guys on the map almost more than winter stuff? Huge, man. Yeah, I'd say so. It's it's the fact that we we didn't have the jumps, the parks, the amount of snow, all of that that they had in places like Vermont even. You know, a lot of people look to the West. But for us growing up, Vermont and New Hampshire to us was what the West is to people in Vermont and New Hampshire. And when you don't have all those things, you've got to get creative and you got to do something different. And it wasn't like we were trying to be different by doing any of this. It was just how do we keep skiing and how do we get rad? And other people began to see it and just thought it was the coolest thing. And I think that's where a lot of our crew's exposure came from. Before social becomes a huge thing, if you're doing a backyard rail setup, it is purely for the love because no one's ever going to see it. Once people start seeing it and you're, you're building features, does that inspire you? Like, hey, next summer we're going to go twice as big. And are you thinking about the response that you're getting from social media or is it still just fun? Yeah, still just fun. We were doing this so far before social media and maybe YouTube was just coming around. Most of our stuff that we filmed, we, we put up on those media sources years after. So we were just doing it to doing it. And then some of the Pooper Park stuff, I think it immediately went up to new schoolers. Yep. And we, we had been members of that site since about 2003 or so. And that was like the major media area. And yeah, there was, there was some commenting, people that were really stoked. Of course, a lot of people that were like just your typical new schoolers hate squad. But we just did it to absolutely do it. It was for no likes, no media, no hope of, hey, this is going to get us a sponsor. It was just true love and pure. And how do you fit into that whole crew? Because you're the younger kid. And do they treat you as an equal or are all the pranks on you? No, I think that was something really unique about my upbringing was just being around these older guys. And I was always treated as like, like an equal, even though I was probably like the younger, dumber one, all that. Those guys were great to me, like Will, Andy, Eric, everyone was just part of this crew and everyone was a little bit off in some sort of way. You know, maybe a Matt might be like that a bit, but when we're all in the crew together, I think everyone was like treated pretty good and equal. And of course, I think a lot of fingers are pointed at Ross as being like the total lunatic and making fun of him for things. But he loves it, man. That pressure would just egg him on to do the crazy shit that he does. And he became like a stunt man of our crew. Are you guys competing a lot in the winter? Because I'm sure there's a lot of local contests and contests up and down the eastern seaboard. And are you guys part of that? Yeah. We grew up into the comp scene pretty early. And I'd say like within our crew, that was kind of more my focus. You know, the other guys, I think, hit more urban and were better at that than me. But my early on focus turned towards all the competitions, half pipe, slope style, rail jams, and I was doing really well in it. But I started competing since I was about eight years old in mogul contests. We had some local ones at Bristol and we weren't really like accepted into that crowd because there was the mogul crews and like the ski teams. And that shit was just like too structured for us. And we couldn't afford it anyways. There's no chance that we we're gonna be on like a freestyle team. We were just struggling to have my mom work there and get us a pass to ski there and skiing on some like atomic arcs <laughs> i remember it was my first ski that i was doing moguls and like atomic arcs from like basically like a thrift shop and like the next year i remember having dina star speeds and we were like tricking all these jumps and hitting logs and stuff on like what is that ski that was like a little kid's race ski it didn't matter it was lightweight and that worked because we were just little guys you know i was like eight nine years old it wasn't until like maybe I was maybe like nine or 10 that we had this New York X Games come around and we'd, we'd compete in all those and every year just did better and better to the point of where I was winning them. Like straight up winning, like you were on the podium number one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like number one and, you know, I was like the youngest guy competing in all of it. We had a lot of rad rippers coming out of Western New York at that time too. It was, it was a weird scene that so many people were into it and so many people were like really good at it for that time when you just didn't have much in the area for it. Who was coming up that I might have heard of in that New York scene? 
One guy that was kind of past that scene was Tim Russell. By the time like the New York X Games things came around, I think he was moving out west and starting to partake in bigger things like the Gravity Games. And just after him, about the same age as Will and Andy, was a guy named John Shares. And John Shares was his dad was involved in Solomon, I believe. But John was kind of like almost like a golden child of Bristol. He was sick. He had like the sponsorships. He had the cool gear. He had the Solomon twin tips. He had the spiky hair going on. He just totally fit the scene. It was, you know, he was throwing down. He was kind of like one of the top dogs there. And we were kind of this up and coming crew out of the spot that I think like didn't really have sponsors, backing, weren't really like the super cool kids of free skiing there, but we were getting good. You guys were the bad news bears. You guys were like the nerds, the geeks, the hip hop guys, the guys that don't fit any type of mold at that point in time but are crushing it. Yeah, I guess I think that you could say that amongst our entire crowd because you, you've gotten a chance to get to know who Will is, who Andy is. Like He's the, the Dungeons and Dragons master that didn't even ski before, then picked up a pair of ski boards at the age of like 15 or 16. You know, Ross is kind of like computer geeky, but throws down. Eric Olson, like super shy, but just has this crazy bag of jump tricks. On that, you know, hip-hoppy, angry dude, like ski by that 15 year old and say something to him he's going to try and knock you out <laughs> and then there's me and i don't i don't i don't know i don't really have an outside perspective i suppose to go look back on me and be like oh you're obviously the little like tigger of the crowd or something well you're the young cerebral quiet kid who takes it all in and doesn't let anybody pick on him but at the same time is is able to crush it on his skis hopefully this the skiing would do the backing but in terms of the mountain that we grew up at, we were hated. There were some guys within it that wanted to help us or like say they'd be like, yeah, we'll, we'll try to get a jump. We'll try to get your passes back because we kept getting our passes pulled for hitting jumps, doing like tricks not straight down the line of the moguls for trying to go into the woods and slide logs. There's anything. And there was all these yellow jackets, man, these mountain hosts. So what later on, years and years later, becomes the courtesy staff and yellow jackets of Val Resorts, pretty much like originated at our mountain. Bill Rock, he's like the VP of Val, or maybe not VP, but in charge of some sort of public relations. He's really high up there, and he came from Bristol. And I just remember that asshole smashing our jumps, man. <laughs> so this long hated thing for like yellow jackets, courtesy staff, these people that aren't ski patrol. Like I, I got respect for ski patrol; they help people. These other dickweeds, they don't do anything. They're just fun patrol, man. I agree with you. And their job is to get the 18-year-old Garai and take his pass for five days because he's skiing too fast through a slow zone. <laughs> yeah, man. More than that, just trying to stump all the fun. I mean, trying to squash little nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds at the time. That's weak. We're going to talk about something that's not weak really quick, and that is my awesome sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo. And I always tell you how great their in-store experiences are in Denver, Seattle, and Portland. And I always tell you how you can save 10% off on your Evo.com order when you use the code capital TPM, the number 10, when you check out. Or you can mention it in stores when you're checking out to get that 10% off. But one thing I don't talk about enough is Evo Trip Adventure Vacations. Yes, Evo creates vacations to amazing adventure destinations with rad people. It's a once-in-a-lifetime way to experience snow and culture. It's the foundation of what Evo is all about, and now is the time to plan for your Evo trip to Japan this winter. Experience Japan firsthand with some awesome people on your Evo trip. You can find out more about Evo trip over at evo.com, and you can save up to 70% off your gear for that trip right now during Evo's Labor Day sale. Rescue Water is my next sponsor, and they are all about proactive recovery. What does that mean to you? Well, think of it like this. If you're really tired, you skip the coffee and grab an energy drink. Well, if you really need to hydrate, like when you're done a workout or get off the hill or trail, skip the sports drink and drink a cold rescue water. It replaces electrolytes much better than anything else you've ever used to hydrate. It's science and it works. I make it work for me after big nights at the bar. Let me tell you, one rescue water before bed and I'm hangover free in the morning. 
Make rescue water work for you by heading over to rescuewater.com to save 20% on a 12-pack case with the code RESQWATERTPM. Rescue Water is also available on Amazon. My final sponsor brews beer, drinks beer, and wants everyone to drink beer outside. They're the 10-barrel brewery based out of Bend, Oregon, and they are all about supporting action sports and the people that love them. They also happen to make some of the best beer in the world. If you haven't had a 10-barrel, you're missing out. I love the out-of-office Pilsner, but really, I'm happy with any of the beers. They're all really tasty. Next time you head to the store, pick up some 10-barrel and see what I'm talking about. And if you happen to be in Bend, Portland, Denver, Idaho, or San Diego, pop into one of the 10-barrel brew pubs, order a flight, and pick your favorite. Support the beer that supports action sports, the 10-barrel brewery. Find out more at 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors so we can get back into your life. And your brother's older, and all these kids are older than you. So at one point, they all leave the house. I mean, your brother doesn't go to college, but he moves out west. And I don't know if everybody leaves New York, but what happens when everyone moves? Are you kind of just stuck there? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a sad, lonesome time there of little old me getting ditched by everyone. You know, Will and Andy were gone in college in Vermont. When Ross and Berja finally left, he's a year older than me. He went to school in Vermont. I um, met, ditched out two years before I graduated and moved out west. And I started to find a new scene, man. Um, so I'd, I'd hike alone a ton at Bristol, just on all the rails, and would just repeat, hike, hike. Every day after school, hike, and usually session alone a lot. And I got in with like the whole Ski to East guys with like Jeff McDonald and Rooster, they were Meathead Films. Yep. I was competing a lot too. In 2005, when I was like 15, I won that Rails to Riches thing in Killington. So I was a 15 or 16 year old or 15 year old that just won, I think four or $5,000. And I used that and other comp money to go buy my first car. So I bought this Subaru little Impreza Outback wagon and that thing got me all over the East Coast. So I spent like my last two years of school driving all over Vermont and New Hampshire on the weekends. I take off from school at like Friday morning or like noon after some classes, head out for the weekend, go compete or film with those guys and then be back for school Monday morning, whether it was driving through the whole night or whatever. Then I would just go alone. And I think different than like I'm Matt, who is kind of this rebel child. I tried to find a way of if I didn't mess up or didn't piss my parents off, they would let me keep doing this. So I, I tried to like, Instead of being rebellious, hopefully build something up on trust that, hey, I'm going to take off. I'll be back Monday for school. Like a a normal, responsible kid would do instead of a loose cannon. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. But I I don't know how many like 16, 17 year olds are driving seven hours to New Hampshire competing in a, a big slope style and then driving right back and making class. I would think if you don't have your parents' trust and you're the only one at home, you could very easily be the whipping boy and doing every little thing at home of every chore and everything your dad needs you to do. So it's like you have to escape with skiing and you have to have their trust to be able to come and go as you please. Yeah, definitely. High school-wise, you're the smarter of the two, I would say, brothers. Maybe not street smarts and everything, that's that's debatable. But when it comes to book smarts, it seems like you put more into your education, you and probably your sisters who are nurses and engineers put more into their education where I met maybe put more into his athleticism. Did you do well in school? Yeah, I did, I did really well. A lot of it was motivation too to be able to go out west. I saw as like maybe my only way to be able to afford to move out west was to get a good scholarship or a full ride, move out west, go to school and just try to ski every day. And uh, I just kind of knew that I wasn't going to get sponsor money or be able to make any sort of living or career off of skiing to be able to afford me moving out west. So I, I performed the hell out of school and I graduated Saluda Victorian by like micro points. I don't know what Saluda Victorian is. I think if you don't come near that, you don't even know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for the people that have more street sparts than me, that's second to the Val Victorian. So. You're second in your class. You didn't get the full ride that they promised you or anything, but I had like a near perfect GPA and did really well in all the state exams and national exams type things. 
It's like the story of your whole life. You're second to a Met in skiing and you're second to the valedictorian in smarts. Oh, man, that's got that's kind of harsh coming from you right there. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I can do that on everything. <laughs> Man, you can go back over all the competition records and I'm usually standing on top of him on the podium. That is funny. So how did he take that when you were on top of him? Because I do have that as a question where were you beating your brother, but I passed over it. Yeah, you know, Ahmed never really did that good in competitions. And I think today, even any time that he's really tried to compete, it just doesn't go well, like either some bullshit judging or like his helmet flies off or ski releases something like that and that's never gone well for him and maybe that's why it pushed him so hard to become just a film guy no but i was doing pretty good all across you know i, I competed in half pipe too we had these soby half pipe jams at bristol and those were sick that was like a big session of all the local dudes and this is like 2001 2002 on like an eight foot half pipe and we'd like build extensions out of the pipe too to make it like a foot or two taller so you could actually stay in the pipe and Tim Russell was just boosting these hits out of that pipe that had to have been as tall as the half pipe. So going eight, 10 feet out of an eight foot pipe, doing fat like alley mute grabs, 540s, all that on straight skis. So I'm going to take it back to your scholarship. Do you have a full ride to University of Utah? No, I, I got a pretty good deal that was like paying a little bit better than what someone in state would pay. Okay. You know, I, I applied to some other schools. I applied to like Boulder and stuff and checked it out. And then when we saw what the bill was going to be, it was just laughable. It was like, not a chance I'm going to go here. It was like 40 grand a year, or 40 grand a semester. Jesus. So Utah was really the only choice. And I had so many friends here at the time from like all the East Coast guys had moved out. So we got like mad four by nine crews and the East Coast guys too. People that we met competing in the East. It was definitely seemed like a super welcoming place to come to and like, LJ Strenio was out here. I'd skied with him a ton in Vermont, New Hampshire with the Meathead guys. And he was just a total welcomer of me. LJ, he's one of the, the most fun people. He just has so much energy. But I feel like he's a dude who either has so much energy and is super happy or is super low as well. Is that something that I'm just perceiving or is that how he is? He's just super driven to push himself. And one moment when things are going good... He's on top of the world. He's so smiley, so happy. And then as soon as like you, you take some crashes, you can't get a trick. Something's just not clicking. He beats himself up about it. But I wouldn't say that's abnormal. Like I've definitely been around all, all my life, like, you know, smashing skis on rails and getting super heated about not being able to push yourself. That hockey temper comes out when you're not getting your trick and you know you can get it. And at the time, too, like in media, I think it showed it more. And maybe that's something that like reflected on us growing up was I just remember seeing some pros in like probably before propaganda or that era, like propaganda balance Berman's first movie there, just smashing skis. You're just breaking your shit. You're breaking poles. Maybe that was part of this like bad boy image in skiing. Yeah. And it was a lot of young people too. Yeah. Yeah. They, they seemed old at the time, but they were really just like 18 year olds and I was 11 years old watching them so it seemed like they were older and mature and beating up shit in your college career you go to school for what the next year or two full time before you realize you want to take a year off and focus on skiing yeah yeah it was in my junior year for anyone who's in engineering they probably know what mechatronics is i was in this mechatronics class which was like a little bit more robotics than what i'd wanted to study i was more of in the whole solid mechanics realm so i really like to design physical things that you can actuate like mechanisms and I love the mathematics behind it all analyzing the strengths of things like the most equatable would be like let's just say in terms of designing skis it's super easy to measure flex patterns and radii all these are physical but playing with robots wasn't that fun to me and doing all the electrical engineering behind it and mathematics of it I just needed a break I felt like I was straying away from my passion and skiing was going good in that fall i was having a blast and i took the spring semester off i was just like fuck this I, I need to get out of this for a little bit and come back to school like super motivated again but for now i just need to go pursue skiing and what happens with your scholarship are you able to keep it so i met with all the advisors and they were like yeah yeah you're fine you can just go ahead and return to a full load after the spring semester take summer classes take fall whatever 
and you'll still have it. When I returned back to school, it was completely gone. Huh. That there was a lapse. They said that as soon as you don't have more than 12 credit hours, I would lose it. So you didn't know that going in and then that ends up costing you a lot of money at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Because after that, I'm still paying out of state tuition at that point. And I tried to get my residency. They said that because I had an out of state tuition, I didn't have the intent to become a resident. So I had to wait a full year before getting in state. And I lost the scholarship. Well, that sucks. Yeah, but that season was killer. That was like the best season I'd ever had up to that point. Are you able to make it healthy through that whole season? Yeah, I think I did. Ahmet gave me his old snowmobile, this thing we called Ronald McDonald, red sled with some yellow on it. And it was Craig Coker's before. So it was just a hand-me-down throughout the ski industry. Yeah. I took that thing. I traveled along with uh, DOS Media, this guy Bentley Atterbury, and... We went and filmed a fucking sick urban trip in Omaha, Nebraska. We went to Colorado, skied a bunch of backcountry, built some sweet jumps. It was awesome, man. I was skiing so good in the backcountry and just having a blast getting out of school. And you mentioned Craig Coker. You mentioned him because of a sled you were on, but I think the War of Rails might have been his event. Yeah, yeah. And that probably was one of the worst events for you ever, I would think. You had a a pretty bad experience there? One of the best events and one of the worst for me. Talk about it. What happens there? So this is about a year, maybe two years after taking those seasons off. So I went back to school. It was spring 2013. I was almost graduating college and I went to the War of Rouse. It's a migration that we had done for like three seasons before that. We go there, compete. I'd done pretty well. I think I podiumed in like two of those War of Rouse. And then was coming back for my third one and just kind of pressure on. I know Ahmet was there at that comp and it was super icy in the mornings because like take Southern California in late March. It's definitely getting warm to slush up during the day and freezes hard during the night. Yeah. We're practicing and he's just like, dude, I'm not fucking doing this, man. It's so icy. This is this is even worth it. And. I competed a lot more and was just like, yeah, this is just how it is competing. It sucks in the morning, but then it gets better. And also had a lot of pressure. Like there's a lot of big names there and the features got bigger and bigger every year. It was basically like a super park of rails at this point. And I wanted to prove myself with those big names there too. Like if I can podium again or do super well like that could be a nice shot for me graduating college and being able to pro ski maybe. Practice went okay, made it through all that, and then started to slush up a bit. And they right before my heat, they salted right on the jump for this up rail. And it was like an up rail to a, maybe like a 20-foot gap to a downslope landing. That went on for a while, but it was all built up and beefy. They salted, like not the in-run, but right on the jump. So I'm skiing down. I'm trying to get as much speed as I can. And then I hit hyper speed going off the jump right. hit the up rail instantly know like i was doing cork seven off of it or cork six mid cork six i'm just like oh my god i'm so far past the landing so far past this i'm screwed and came down kind of on my side dropped like i don't know 20 25 feet from the air onto concrete landing that was all iced up from them salting instantly knew when i landed on my side that i'd, I'd broken my body it was, just, it was the, definitely the most pain I've ever experienced. It was like coming from my back and my pelvis. My right leg was just full paralyzed. I couldn't move. I was just laying there. And I couldn't believe that I was like that guy. You watch all these comps growing up. You see all these things like someone getting like seriously hurt. And now this time it's you. I just remember like the patrol rushing over, a met rushing over. And I was just in, in screaming pain. And I, I, I've never ever been like, knocked out or gone into shock or anything and i wish it had happened so i wouldn't have to deal with that amount of pain do you get airlifted somewhere yeah they take me into the ski patrol real quick like you know wheel off the meat carton and stick me in there and they're just kind of feeling around and they grab like the back of my pelvis and they tell me to stick my hand there and they're like hey is this normal for you it felt like grabbing a climbing hold the back of my pelvis had snapped completely in half and it was so offset. It was offset by like two inches. So I could stick my fingers all the way around and grab it like a full on rock. I just kind of like freaked out. I remember that feeling just being like, oh my God, like this is not normal. 
And they immediately uh, life flighted me to San Bernardino. And we don't need to go through all the, the surgeries and everything, but how long does that take you to recover? It was big. It was like, I'd say about a year. And is it just your pelvis? I think you did your knee too, but I don't know if that was the same injury. I had some like small knee injuries here and there that just took out a lot of skiing time for me. I, I definitely battled with injuries through college of small things like partially torn Achilles tendon that just kind of kept coming back, MCL tears. I never did the full like ACL, meniscus, PCL, any of that, luckily. Yeah. So, you know, knock on wood, but I think I paid my toll with the broken back and pelvis. But yeah, recovery was super long. And immediately, Will Wesson had reached out to the High Fives Foundation because he knew that I had this big pelvis and spinal injury. Yeah. Those guys did a lot for me when I thought everything was finished. I'm wearing a high five shirt as we speak, but the things that those guys do for people, it's really amazing because they get people at their all time low when they think everything is taken away and they give them hope. And that hope is transitioned into actual doing shit that they really wanted to do again, given it might take a year or two, but they get people surfing, they get people doing things they didn't think they'd ever be able to do. And what do they do for you? Because I mean, at the end of the day, your injury isn't as serious as a lot of the high fives injuries. Yeah, I think I just got really, you could say really unlucky with the fall, but you can also say really lucky that I was able to walk again. It was definitely one of those, like I was was paralyzed at first. They had the choice of doing a, a major surgery and trying to move everything back into place and stick some huge rods all the way through my pelvis. They were able to pull everything apart, stick it back together and free up those nerves and such that were causing the lack of feeling and mobility in my leg. And then high fives, I got in touch with them. They basically like gave me some funding for me to be able to pay some rent and also pay for acupuncture and physical therapy. These things that, you know, a broke ass 23 year old who just graduated college or is graduating, you have no money. Yeah. So what are you going to spend it on, like food, or are you going to spend it on physical therapy? And without high fives, there's no way I would have been able to get good treatment, get good massages and care, and be able to actually just focus on like my life and getting back on my feet. They tried to make everything else easy for me so I could focus on the bigger picture instead of being so caught up. Aside from the injury, you know, you're at this contest, you're thinking if you have a great finish, maybe it's going to help you transition into pro skierdom. And I would say for you, becoming a pro skier is more challenging than almost anyone else out there. One, because you have an older brother. And then you look at the way your older brother skis. And I would say, while you might be better in contests, your brother might have more style. I mean, you're a big skier, so it's hard to make everything look as smooth, but you're able to make that happen. No, oh, man, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem. But it is a hard thing for a bigger skier to do. Your brother's established. He's got sponsors. He's got a personality and he's known. And unless you're winning every single contest you're in, it's going to be hard. Do you realize that in your career that it's going to take um, not a miracle, but something huge to make you a big name pro? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was just sort of like this combination to a lock that I couldn't figure out. I was like, man, you know, I'm competing, I'm filming these cool things, but I just can't get any sponsor dollars. You can break out in two different ways, right? You can break out with filming a sick segment, or you can break out with your competition status. And the competitions, I think for me, were done at that point. That injury had set me back, and you just need so much money and time to be able to train these big tricks that are coming around now. Like when I was competing successfully in my teens, you could get by doing switch 12s and single flip stunts out there by the time i was about 20 like 23 in that area you had to be doing two double corks and that requires like hitting good jump setups quite often training at places like an olympic park and having ramps then i just didn't have access to that so i felt like i was kind of just shit out of luck and it's not just making it onto the scene. I've been on the scene and that's part of the problem was when people kind of know you being there existing, you're not going to be a breakout skier. People already know your name, but you're just nothing special. It would take a lot. And I didn't have that. There was just really no way for me. 
And I got back on my feet after the injury, started skiing again and didn't think I would go anywhere with it. I was just lucky enough to like be back on my feet. And I remember the first session that I went skiing was in like mid-September in Utah. It snowed. I just had these rods taken out. And it's a really bizarre story how that happened. I went on this session with Tanner Hall came up and hit this wall ride with me with uh, Jess Tiswell was there. She was Tanner Hall's personal PT. And she ended up actually right after my injury, Tanner called and said like, hey, this guy, he's Ahmed's brother. He's super injured. Jess, like, can you go and help take care of him in Utah? And yeah, she showed up in my house and helped take care of me, massaged pelvis back, anything to help. Man, having like one of your childhood legends do something like that for you without even knowing him just left like such a good taste in my mouth for life of Tanner Hall. Yeah, because that's one of those things no one's ever heard. It speaks volumes about him as a person. And we see things on the internet that he might put out there, but you don't see about the compassion of him taking his personal PT, sending him your way to make sure you're okay, even though he doesn't know you. Yeah, yeah. And I think in today's day and age, so many people would maybe post something like that on social media. And so many people do it about that. And that's what I love too, is Tanner just did that to do it out of the good of his heart and caring. And it, it wasn't for any alternative thing. And to actually get to ski with him right after that too, you know, it was like nine months later, but you know, here's this guy who like sent his PT and his PT came out and we were, we were skiing this wall ride that was built by the hood crew up in Garzens Pass. And it was so good feeling, man. Like I just couldn't believe that I was on skis again. I took a little fall and it didn't hurt. And my mind was blown. I didn't think I'd ever be able to ski. It was the most amazing feeling again, no matter it's just sliding a rail or stalling on a wall ride, doing something that you used to do in the past that made you so happy. There's really nothing like it. No, and I would think it fills you with probably so much joy and you're so fired up on skiing again that you want to do something for the sport, but you realize that, hey, I'm not going to be the guy who's going to be the big name pro. A Met's got this position and I'm coming off these injuries and I just want to help. And is that when you called Jason Leventhal and say, hey, man, how can I help you out? Yeah, yeah, that's cool you know that. I had ridden for Jay since I was 15 with line skis. So I, I approached him. I was just kind of like, hey, Jay, like, I, you know, I saw your email that you were leaving line and starting your own mission. We have a long history. If there's anything I can do to help out, let me know. Like, you know, I'm coming off this injury. I don't know if I'll be able to ski good again, but I want to be a part of it. And so he kind of flew under the radar starting up this Jay skis and – I hopped back on the sticks and started testing skis for him and trying to get him media. I believe Jason's the one who crafted your persona today, but really it was crafted from birth. You've always been in the shadow of your older brother. You've always been a Mets brother. You never really owned that. It was just kind of like, hey, oh, my brother's this and I'm this guy. But once you went with Jay skis and started helping Jay out, the Mets brother persona took over and it became really funny. Because it was the only way you were going to step out of your brother's shadow was to use your brother as the joke. Yeah, that's right. The slingshot off of it. Yeah. And it's cool, man. I started skiing on, on the Jays. And finally, he was building a pow stick, which I wanted for so long before I was skiing on his park skis. And I had to use my old line skis for doing any powder stuff. Okay. And I kind of made more of a commitment to powder after this because I was like, I'm never going to be able to ski park again. Like, I can't take another hit like this or else I'm done. Right. I don't need to press my luck again. And got on the pow stick and I was filming this edit with Henny Van Jarsfield. It was over at Elta and then some of the surrounding backcountry. And someone up top at Elta was just like, hey, man, you're the brother of that guy. You're Ahmed's brother, right? And for a moment, like, I almost got angry. Because I've been called that my whole life. Like, yeah, dude, this is Ahmet's brother. This is the brother of Ahmet. You know, it's a descriptive term at this point. Right. And then all of a sudden, like something just changed in me and it clicked. And I was just like, yeah, man, I'm Ahmet's brother. Nice to meet you. So all of a sudden, everything just flipped where it was a descriptive term. But then it became a pronoun. It became my name, Ahmet's brother. And it turned. The name of the edit was like... Ahmed's brother, like I wish I was Sammy's brother because Sammy Carlson just came out with that like fire edit documentary thing. 
was just so good in the backcountry, and that's what my edit was, was just skiing pow and backcountry. In the beginning, I was like, fuck, man, I wish I was Sammy's brother. <laughs> that's great. So once that edit came out, like people kind of bit on to this um, that's brother thing, and I remember being in the lodge one morning at Alto, like waiting for the bombs to go off, and Sage Caterbrigo Loso was in there. You know, absolute legendary big mountain skier, everything. And he was like, dude, I want to see the edit. So I showed him it and he was like, you know, what's really funny about this Ahmed's brother thing. It's going to work. And I was like, what do you mean it's going to work? And he's like, it's going to work, man. You'll see. And sure as shit it did, huh? Sure as shit. It got me a fucking trilogy of Ahmed's brother skis with Jay. And how many pro models has Ahmed had? I mean, I think the revolt with vocal is his collaboration or pro model yeah but i don't see revolt in anybody's name i look at a pro model where it would say either garai or ahmed's brother and that kind of has your signature on it given they can give your brother a royalty for a revolt but it's not the ahmed didali revolt yeah i remember when the first one came out the first ahmed's brother i sent a picture of it to ahmed and i was like yeah you can thank me later for getting you your first pro model (laughs) and what's great about it is it's all about being in the shadows. It's all about skiing and it's not about the name. It's just what lurks in the shadow. And the ironic thing about it is, you know, it's on Matt's name on the ski. My name was not on that ski at all. Right. And you need a Met to still have good parts every year so you can still cast that shadow to make a Met's brother relevant. Yeah, yeah. It's riding off the coattails there. It's like a parasite and a host. Yeah, but the parasite could get bigger than the host without having to do as much. The host needs to work harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, this tapeworm has grown huge from that host and fed away. And I think now maybe it's more self-sustaining at this point where maybe it doesn't need the host. Yeah. Well, it's been really cool to see how a career that lived in the shadows was able to figure out how to take those shadows and put you into the limelight because that's a really cool thing but that's not all you're about i mean you're you're a skier but you're an engineer i mean where a met might have more of the cool factor you might have more of the nerd factor and i mean that in an endearing way because you're a smart dude and when smart people are in this industry who understand engineering people find them and want to work with them and chris truneck finds you or you find him and he's working on There was the old Alpine Trekker bindings that used to be the day wreckers, and they never functioned properly, but they were a great idea. It was, hey, you're going to have the same performance as your standard binding, but you are going to be able to tour in the backcountry, and you're going to have the same downhill performance that you've always had. And you guys came together to create a binding like the old Alpine Trekker that wasn't a day wrecker, but a day maker. Is that right? That's right, man. We're we're trying to flip the whole persona of of what the old alpine trekker was and take it from that day record to day maker between the two of us we had so many days that were ruined out there on this device because when you go out it's hard to make that compromise of do you take a heavier setup touring like with a frame binding when you're going to go hit a jump or do you take maybe something lightweight that's going to break or put your knees in danger and you can go out on like tech toe bindings set them to non-release go trick a jump and tear your shit for life or you can go take your heavy frame binding and just waste all that energy and not quite do tricks how you want to be higher off the snow all those there's been times when i've been out there on the old adapter hiked up this huge 2500 avert and then the last 500 feet they broke and I was with the photographer and everything. I was about to ski this place called Wolverine Cirque. And I was like, well, man, like we're all the way up here. It's epic conditions. I'm not going to give up on this. So I boot packed the last 500, skied into the chute and down the Wolverine Cirque while he was shooting photos. And then boot packed all like 1,500 feet out of this spot and waist deep powder. <laughs> and I was like, dude, this needs to change, man. The ski industry needs to change. And I used to go tour out there on my frame bindings with a pair of jump skis on my back and that's maybe something that people commonly saw when like the big sessions off pyramid and chads were going down or people would even boot pack in we wanted to create a zero compromise system for this stuff when does this product launch so we've launched our first ones for sale in the summer of 2016 
But leading up to it was quite long. I actually moved in with Chris before I had known that he was working on this. I had come off that injury and then I got a job snowmaking at the Olympic Park. I was just dirt broke and Ahmet actually let me have his Honda Civic. So for a little bit, I was sleeping in his Honda Civic and working at the Olympic Park. I didn't have a place to live or anything. And Chris said that he had a room in his basement for rent for like 200 bucks a month. So just by destiny there, I fell into his house paying dirt cheap rent. And one day he was like, dude, I got to show you something and pulled up this design on his computer and like a, a little wooden prototype of it. And I thought it was the coolest because I, I wanted to work on a new adapter system for so long. And I was just like, holy shit, man, we've got to do this. And Chris is a total like backyard tinker guy. He's just your, your garage creative. And he just wanted to make something. But I think I was the one who really saw the potential in it and just knew that for how bad I wanted that product to work. There was a lot of other people out there with the same problems as us. And we needed to create something that we could share with them. And do you look at it as destiny? Like, hey, I moved in with this dude who happens to have a wooden prototype of the binding I need? Yeah, I really think so. And yeah, I, I feel like I run into these circumstances just all the time through my life. It's just you're thinking along one spectrum. And the next thing you know, that person you were thinking about, like, hits you up or that design you want to create, you, you meet someone that has the right key for it. And, you know, Chris had the room for rent and he had the idea that i wanted to make better. And we got together. He had the creative tinker talent and I had the, the engineering prowess of structure and concrete design to make this happen. And where can people find out about the product? You can go to daymakertouring.com to go check out the product and also read more about the physics behind it and what we're trying to do because it's more than just an adapter system in the backcountry. It also changes the way that you walk in the backcountry. We're the first walking system to utilize a four bar linkage, which creates more of like an elliptical pathway. It gives you better traction in the snow. It's easier on the knee. It brings back some of the mechanics to your knee that's sacrificed by your ankle being fixed in a boot. I look at how you're doing this and just hearing how functional it is. Most engineers are in an office 40 hours a week and maybe get 10 days on snow to engineer stuff and test what they're doing, where you kind of do that backwards, where you spend all your time on the snow and realize what the product needs to be. And then you're designing for actually being out there where product engineer at a major company, they're trying to make a sellable product that they can market to this market and do this where you're like, hey, no, this is for this type of skier and this is going to be the most functional thing out there. Yeah, well, you're, you're absolutely right on hitting a point where designing something, that design comes from fulfilling a need. And the only way to see these problems truly and come up with the issue that needs to be fulfilled is being out there all the time. So by being out there all the time as a professional skier's brother, I experienced a lot of these problems and knew that we had to design something to, to fulfill it. So, yeah, you're right. You know, there's people that sit in, in these offices trying to create a problem through marketing, and they say that they have the solution to it. We don't need to create that problem. Our customers send us an email with that problem all the time, and we have the solution for it. It's a product that has been in the works for a, quite a few years now, and it is something that is on snow being tested every time you're out in the mountains, which I know is as much as you possibly can. So I would check that out over at daymakertouring.com. At this point, I am at the part of the show where we do inappropriate questions. And we were supposed to do this podcast yesterday, and I was going to talk with Andy Perry. He was going to redeem himself because he was embarrassed with the questions that he had asked your brother. And Andy and I were going to do this last Thursday, and I will say I didn't call Andy when I was supposed to. So we rescheduled. It did not happen. And Andy has been off radar for two days. He's probably out doing something fun. So I'm going to ask you three inappropriate questions. One is going to call Andy out on things. I'll probably do that first. So I wouldn't say that the younger I Hate New York crew was the best with the ladies or the dudes for that matter. And I don't know your sexual preferences and I don't care. But who was the worst with the opposite sex or the sexual preference growing up? Who was the most awkward? Yeah, I think 
we all maybe had our own stories, our, our times running around with, with different chicks, getting involved. Maybe someone stopped hanging out with the crew as much. <laughs> we'll lessen. And Ahmet always had his girlfriend and stuff. But, you know, Eric Olson was definitely the, the most recluse. I don't think that whole time through knowing him until maybe some time in Utah in the past couple years that he's been around some chick, but there was never any times of him telling us stories, him bailing on the group to go hang out with some girls. And then we'd, we'd have our little instances too at like Vermont open or something where we go maybe try to chase some girls in the hot tub, but Eric wasn't to be found to each his own. I'm going to jump into question number two here. Now I heard there's a total dick move that you had with your brother and his dog Tupac. And what was that all about? <laughs> this was this was bad. Some people are definitely gonna come after me for this guy. But I um, got this dog, Tupac. He had it basically like raised in his car in Mount Hood. The worst behaved dog, and he brought it back to like one of my college houses. I met ended up living with us for maybe about a year. It was me, two other guys in school, and then I met and he left the dog on us all the time. He's like a pro skier. He doesn't have time for this. We're in school. We're trying to work. This dog needs to like play. And it's, it was like tearing up shit in the house. We put it out on a leash outside and it would just bark up the neighborhood. There was one time where there was like a little girl on a tricycle riding by. And if she got any closer, that dog would have ripped her head off. <laughs> Pretty vicious. And I was like, dude, I can't deal with this any longer. It had been like months and months of it and a Met's never there. I'm scared that this dog is gonna kill someone and I'm gonna get like a fine or something worse. And finally I'm like, all right, Pac, load up in my car. And I, I took the dog up to like a really nice community in Salt Lake and just kind of dropped him off at a Mormon church. And that's it? And that's it. He seemed like he was in heaven. You know, maybe he found a family and has a better life, but at that house and being around its non-existent parent was was not the life for Tupac. Tupac was picked up by a nice Mormon family with 16 children and had so much love he did not know what to do with it after that. Totally different Tupac tale. So we are going to go into the final inappropriate question, which is one that I'm going to have to think of right now on the spot, which is not a big problem for me. We haven't talked about trouble at all. And your brother seemed to get into a bunch of trouble. He was the guy who would fight people on the hill. Now, were you ever involved in any fights or have any attitude like that? Or was it totally separate from you? I had some like very little scuffles, but nothing like on that there at the mountain. How about arrests? Any arrests in your history? Yeah, well, me and Ahmed got arrested like early on for snowmobiling into a rail. We were out of school and Pat Goodenough was there too. So usually anything with Ahmet and Pat Goodenough, like it's not going to end well. Okay. Yeah, we were, we were snowmobile towing into this rail and I was probably like 14 and those guys were like 16 and 17 and beating up the lawn there, ripped that shit apart must be. Uh, I didn't really notice. We were just having too much fun. A cop showed up. They were like, what, what are you guys doing? Like you can't be using a snowmobile on a school property, vandalizing all this shit. Yeah, they arrested us for it and like impounded the sled. And I think our parents were just like, well, like, what the fuck? Seriously? Like, why do you think that you can even do that? Does Ahmet get in more trouble for this than you because he's the older one or are they just pissed off at both of you? I think he maybe got in a little bit more trouble and law wise, probably Pat because it was more like his truck that brought it. And I think he's the oldest one. So not terrible. I mean, as long as it's ski related, it's not like it's a, a substance thing or anything like that. So that's good to hear. I will say that it's been an awesome podcast. I think when talking to your brother, it was great to hear your side of the coin because you guys are the yin and yang. And it was cool to hear both sides of it. And what's really is exciting is that you're creating a product that right now might not have a ton of movement because maybe a ton of people haven't heard of it yet. But once people realize what you've created, I have a feeling you're going to be onto something big and you're going to be able to create accessories and a whole product line that goes with it. And it's pretty exciting to see a dirtbag skier be able to make that happen. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, man. It was great to reminisce about the past days and let's make some days out there. So that was time with Garai Dadali. And if you haven't heard my podcast with his brother, Ahmet Dadali, 
give it a listen. It gives you a great background on both Ahmet and Garai. And it's cool to see how two brothers with very similar experiences can turn out so different. Both are awesome guys, and I feel like Garai is the one that has the chip on his shoulder. He's got something to prove outside of being a skier, and now he has a product that the market wants and needs. He just needs to get the word out. It's cool to see Ryder owned back in skiing. And it's cool to see a family have so much success in the ski world, and we look for a lot of great things to come from Garai and Ahmet in the years to come. Now is the point in the show where I ask you to help me out by subscribing to my newsletter or my poos letter or my number twos letter, whatever you want to call it. It fits the Powell Movement theme, and once I have the right amount of subscribers, it's going to come out once a week, and I'm going to tell you about giveaways that I've got going on, upcoming guests, and who knows what else. I also want to ask you to give me a review on whatever platform you listen to me on, especially if you're a regular listener. It really helps the show grow, and it's appreciated. If you're on an iPhone, it takes a minute, and here's what you need to do. Go to podcasts on your iPhone or iTunes and search for The Powell Movement. Scroll down to where you see the stars, hit five stars, and you're done. It's that easy. Thank you so much for doing it. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing sponsors, Evo, Rescue Water, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.